Now in regards to neurotransmission, and this one um, is diagramming the serotonin neurotransmission, a lot of people are unaware that the pharmaceuticals that are used today, and by the way, antidepressants are in that category of the number one class of drugs sold in America today. So if you work at a pharmacy, you're seeing these things fly off the shelves all the time. These medicines actually do not improve your ability to make serotonin, nor do they actually improve the amount of receptors on the neuron. But yet the doctor is giving this to you and saying, you need this to help your serotonin. How is it helping your serotonin? Anyone? You see that serotonin reuptake port? After that um, serotonin is grabbed up by the receptor and there's an electrical transmission occurs, it's not engulfed by the receiving target cell. It's actually then released, and when it's released, there are vacuum cleaners in the neuron that just released it to bring it back up into the neuron. That is for efficiency reasons. We know that that neuron's gonna need to fire again, and we need to have enough serotonin that's left. But if there's not enough serotonin in those vesicles there, and you're not getting the neurotransmission uh, that should occur, or the synaptic transmission, when we plug up those vacuum cleaners, there's more serotonin in that synaptic cleft, and it's a greater likelihood that you'll be able to get synaptic activity from that serotonin. So this is one of the reasons why antidepressants are, tend to be short-term gains and long-term problems. Because Temple University and others have demonstrated that when we continue to plug those vacuum cleaners up, we end up depleting the neuron of the very substance that we were short of to begin with. And that means there's not enough serotonin there at all. And now we have to increase the dose and we have to add other medicines. And by the time a patient ends up in our program, the average is four different medicines trying to plug up all of these reuptake channels. There's norepinephrine reuptake channels and there's dopamine and there's others and so th these channels are all attempting to be plugged up instead of actually dealing with the underlying issue that may be a serotonin deficit. If you have a serotonin deficit, instead of plugging up the reuptake channels, what about actually being on a diet that improves your neuron's ability to produce serotonin? And this is also why we are seeing results that are unprecedented when we compare them with medication. Now, one of the newer things related to depression and anxiety is the inflammatory component. Uh, everyone who comes to our program, we measure their C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker, as well as other inflammatory markers. An increased CRP has been directly correlated with excessive glutamate in the basal ganglia of patients with depression. Inhibitory effects of inflammation are on monoamine metabolism and BDNF. That means if we're not able to produce monoamines, we're not able to produce these neurotransmitters. And the inflammation actually decreases our ability to make BDNF. And inflammation has been found to be associated with a poor response to conventional antidepressants. So if you have inflammation on board, you're very likely to be called treatment-resistant depression, which is where a lot of our patients are at. Treatment-resistant doesn't mean that they'll never get better from depression. It just simply means that their depression is not better with medication. Uh, it might have improved a little bit, but you know, it's not, uh, it, it, they haven't resolved the problem. <laughs> There's no, uh, when we test them, they still are in the severe depression category. And so, of course, what we would need to do in those cases is to decrease the inflammation. Individuals with a CRP greater than one, which is a cutoff for moderate inflammation, were less likely to respond to SSRIs if they had a CRP greater than one. And high CRP was also known to predict response to the anti-inflammatory drug infliximab, which is an inhibitor of tumor necrosis factor, one of the things that is released with inflammation. Now, it's kind of interesting that they're using infliximab for depression. Now, infliximab, anyone know what the trade name of that is? Yeah, Remicade. 
Uh, Remicade, uh, for those of us in gastroenterology or in autoimmune disease, Remicade is used in Crohn's disease. It's used in rheumatoid arthritis. It's a very expensive drug that has to be injected into the system. You can't swallow it. Um, and then there can be lots of reactions. You can actually have depression as a result of it. You're more likely to end up with pseudomonas infections and things like that. So it's a very serious thing. And whenever we're prescribing these type of drugs for the difficult inflammatory patient, we're having to discuss with them the benefits and the risks of this. But you can see how desperate our world has become over treating depression, that we're taking people with inflammation and giving them Remicade to try to see if they can get better, which of course costs thousands of dollars a month and those sorts of things in order to try to help. And it turned out it actually did help those with a CRP greater than one as far as helping their depression by decreasing the amount of inflammation. 45% of patients enrolled in a study on treatment resistant depression had a CRP of greater than three, which is severe inflammation. And so many people are trying to develop drugs for treating depression and anxiety by trying to inhibit that COX-2 reaction that actually turns arachidonic acid into prostaglandin E2, which is one of those big inflammatory molecules that's going to cause a lot of problems, decreasing BDNF, decreasing our ability to make the neurotransmitters, and those sorts of things. And of course, there have been COX-2 inhibitors around for a while that aren't used near as much as when I was starting out in medicine which are typically the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs because they increase risk of kidney failure, they increase risk of stomach ulcers and bleeding and all sorts of things like that. Uh, and so that's not really safe COX-2 inhibition. They're still used today uh, because we're weighing benefits versus risks. And by the way, those have a side effect in actually inducing depression in some people that don't even have depression. So it's one of those things that we have to weigh it out. But there is a way of safe COX-2 inhibition without having to give Remicade and without having to give you know, these drugs that we'll talk about. Studies have also suggested that minocycline, which inhibits the inflammatory mediator um, uh, cyclooxygenase, that's the COX-2, has antidepressant efficacy. How did we find out that? These were young girls who were depressed and had acne. And this is one of the primary acne treatments, is putting them on minocycline. And minocycline actually inhibits the COX-2 inhibitor some. And so not only would their acne get better, but they noticed their depression was getting better. And their parents thought it was just because their acne was getting better. Maybe they're depressed because they're acne. No, it wasn't so much acne. It was the inflammation going on. Uh, and so uh, these are, again, uh, indicators of decreasing inflammation helping. So my question is, why not decrease the fuel of chronic inflammation? Instead of inhibiting COX-2 with all the side effects of doing so, why not eliminate the fuel that starts the whole process, and that is arachidonic acid? Arachidonic acid, if we eliminate that from the diet, what a difference it makes. Because we are dramatically decreasing the inflammation. This is why people with autoimmune disease come to New Start. They come to New Start, and they're put on an arachidonic acid-free diet, and all of a sudden, within a few days, their arthritis and their pain and those type of things start to let up significantly where they were having to take all of these drugs before. And then why not improve the ratio of arachidonic acid to the anti-inflammatory omega-3 fatty acids instead? Omega-3 fatty acids is going to actually also inhibit COX-2 by um, going down another prostaglandin pathway. This study done recently, several quotes from it, um, showing the advantages of down with arachidonic, arachidonic acid, that's what AA stands for, and up with EPA, DHA, those are the long chain omega-3s. These results provide prospective evidence. This was a prospective trial that elevated AA EPA plus DHA ratio is associated with increased vulnerability developing depression in response to exposure to systemic inflammation. Additionally, the AA EPA DHA ratio is correlated with baseline sleep quality, and we have previously observed that poor sleep is a strong risk factor for depression during systemic inflammation. So when you have more inflammation in your body, you're not going to be able to sleep as efficiently, and you, we can actually help that out by lowering the arachidonic acid. Notably, therefore, the arachidonic acid EPA-DHA ratio continued to predict depression incidence 
even when including sleep in the model, suggesting that both are independent indicators of depression vulnerability. So it's not that the depression is occurring because you're not sleeping. It's that the depression is occurring from the inflammation, and the inflammation is why you're not sleeping. So even if we try to get you to sleep with sleeping pills, your depression isn't going to get better because the cause is the inflammation. And again, this is why we need to get to the underlying cause and why we're measuring all of these inflammatory components when people come to the program. So where is arachidonic acid found? The number one source of it in the American diet? Chicken. Number two, eggs. Number three, beef. Four, sausage. Five, fish. You know, and we'll talk about fish here in a little bit because fish is a mixed bag because it has those long chain omega-3s that can help with inflammation, but it also has this arachidonic acid. Burgers, cold cuts, pork, Mexican uh, mi mixed dishes, and uh, pizza, of course, that would be the pepperoni pizza. These are the high sources in Australia, and uh, I know we have some Australians here at this conference, so I thought I'd throw that in there. Uh, but uh, uh, Australians like to eat duck eggs and ox liver and emu and kangaroo. Uh, basically, you know, if it's an animal or if it comes from an animal like eggs, it's going to have arachidonic acid. The exception to that is dairy. Dairy does not have arachidonic acid. This was a meta-analysis of dietary patterns, and this is an interesting study. They, they actually looked at a whole host of studies on diet and depression. And a lot of people might say, well, what about this diet? What about the paleo diet? What about just gluten-free? What about this diet, that diet? And so they've looked at it all, and there's only one prospective randomized controlled trial. That is the gold standard in medicine. There's only one prospective randomized controlled trial that showed significant benefit in overcoming depression just by changing the diet. And what was that diet? It was a plant-based diet. How quickly did it improve mood? It improved it in just two weeks. No fish, no poultry, no meat or eggs. Centering it on plants, significant benefit, actually better than Prozac uh, in that two week time period in improving depression. And the study's author stated very clearly this was related to the advantages of no arachidonic acid in the diet. And so we're not fueling the inflammation anymore. And they, they had a third arm, by the way, in this prospective trial. In this prospective trial, they wanted to see what if we give them just the amount of arachidonic acid in fish? You saw fish didn't have as much as chicken and eggs. Only 5%, but we're getting them their EPA and DHA that way. So let's feed them a pesco-vegetarian diet and see how they do. They did better than those on the typical American diet, but it wasn't statistically significant in the two weeks. It wasn't anywhere close to the plant-based diet. So they're saying it's far better to remove the arachidonic acid, even if you're not getting those long-chain EPA DHAs, than it is to give them the long-chain EPA DHA with the arachidonic acid. Now, omega-3 does have benefits that have been well proven. Um, we won't go through all of those improvements there, but these are brain benefits. Omega-3 is an essential fatty acid, and it's one that we need to get in our diet. Better control of thoughts and behavior, that's emotional intelligence. Less impulsivity. It also has been sh shown to be helpful in mental disease. It can improve bipolar disorder. It can improve major depression and anxiety, clinical response rate, uh, similar to the best antidepressants without any of those side effects. It decreases anger in men with aggressive behaviors and problems with the law. It can even help with psychosis and a number of things. But there have been some later studies that have actually shown, and this is the, uh, Dr. Greger who was here three years ago and did an entire lecture on uh, mental illness and nutrients. He showed studies where fish and fish oil do not help depression. In fact, we used to think those things would help depression, but when they did meta-analysis, they found out there was what's called publication bias. Publication bias is if it shows a positive effect, it gets published. If it shows a negative effect, it doesn't get published. But when they looked at all of the studies, they found no benefit to fish consumption. 
And so why was there no benefit? It's because we can't get the mercury out of the fish. By the way, don't think that there's anything called mercury-free fish oil. We can't get it out. We can get some of it out. We can even, there's a patent, there's a company that's patented a three-step removal process that removes over 90% of it, but we can't get all of it out. And the connection between eating fish and body mercury levels is so strong that researchers seeking to determine mercury exposures among groups of people often look at only one dietary factor, and that is fish consumption. These are all the things that mercury can do. Insomnia, nervousness, hallucinations, memory loss, headache, dizziness, anxiety, irritability, daytime drowsiness, emotional instability, depression, poor cognitive function. So if you want to worsen someone's emotional intelligence significantly, get mercury into their ingestion program. And so what they found out is the risks of getting the mercury were better than the benefits of getting those long-term, uh, long-chain omega-3s. Now, 100 years ago, I think fish was a healthy way to get your EPA and DHA. But now we need to go to where the fish get their EPA and DHA. By the way, they don't make it themselves. <laughs> they actually get it in their diets that we'll talk about here in a little bit.